So first, the redemption claim can be known to be true. Um, the redemption claim is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. In order to show that Christianity is true, you just have to show that God exists and that Jesus died and rose from the dead. That is not, that's true, but it's not sufficient for gospel purposes. Uh, if you're going to show that the gospel is true, then according to Paul, you would have to show that Christ died, yes, for our sins, that's the purpose, and then according to the scriptures. So Paul received uh, that Jesus was buried. Now I was talking to my friend Paul Franks, who's the chair of our department, and he was saying, uh, and Paul maybe will clarify this for me, that when uh, um, George Washington died, he said, do not bury me for three days, because there's lots of cases where people would be buried and they weren't really dead, and you'd find the scratch marks on the inside of the coffin. So he said, in order to make sure that I'm really dead, don't bury me for three days. So burial is a way of Paul saying, Jesus wasn't half dead, he was completely dead. And he was in that tomb, buried for three days. Now, uh, if you know what uh, crucifixion involves and the rigors of it, I'll tell you, there's no way that Jesus could have gone through what he went through and been buried and then three days later just sort of revived. Uh, and so one of the ways you can know that is I've got a couple of copies of this really fantastic. Did you know that Jesus' death certificate was actually written in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1986? A Mayo Clinic pathologist went through the data in the Gospels and he wrote Jesus' death certificate. And here's what he said. He died of asphyxiation, which is when you're hanging on a cross, you can't breathe. And can just the part fit it. I've got a limited number of these up here if you're interested in it. It's really good to have it. We know that Jesus died. But the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. There was a purpose for which he died. Um, in other words, the death of Jesus and his resurrection aren't self-interpreting. You need scripture to deliver the interpretation to you. Otherwise, you'll come up with any number of things. People say Jesus beamed back from the dead as an alien and these sorts of things. Scripture actually sets out the meaning or interpretation of that. Um, think about the Emmaus disciples in Luke chapter 24. They meet Jesus, they tell Jesus, strange things are happening, and hear the reports of somebody rising from the dead, or women have seen uh, appearances of Jesus and an angel, but we don't know what these things mean. Right, because those events are not self-interpreted. You have to turn to the scriptures to get the interpretation of those events. And so, uh, in your handout there, Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, look what Jesus says to them. How foolish you are. Uh, maybe your pastor hasn't told you you're foolish for a while. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, Jesus says things that are, are really surprising. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then they get it. So it's not just Jesus died. It's Jesus died for our sins and the scriptural interpretation uh, will provide the clue. Notice, Paul's gospel is for our sins and according to the scriptures. And those are things that we can know to be true. And on your handout, I have two theses that you would have to know to be true in order to know that Jesus died for your sins. One, the iniquity thesis. That's the thesis that the promised Messiah would be an individual who would die for our sins. And you can certainly know that according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace uh, was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own ways. In other words, we're sinners. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, that's dying for, that's not just dying, that's dying for your sins. And you can know that according to the scriptures. So if you were to just to see the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus on a closed circuit television, that's not enough to know what those events mean. The Old Testament scriptures provide the interpretation. And so you have to know that. So according to the scriptures, you can know that that's what the Messiah would do. Then you have to know that Jesus is that promised Messiah. So you have to know the identity thesis, that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And you can also know that. Now, how do you know that Jesus is the promised Messiah? Well, look at Matthew 11, verses 2 through 5. When John heard him in prison, what, what Christ was doing, 
uh, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come? In other words, are you the one from uh, the book of Isaiah who was supposed to have the iniquities of us all placed on him so that we could be at peace? Are you that guy? And Jesus doesn't answer that question by going, yeah, I'm that guy. He says, um, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, look at my miracles, and that's the answer to your question, that I am that person. Now, why is that the answer? Because in the book of Isaiah, all the criteria for the Messiah are listed out in advance. And if you look up those verses, we don't have time to do it today, it says things like this. He'll raise the dead, he'll, he'll um, give sight to the blind, he'll give hearing to those who are deaf, and, and he'll preach the good news to the poor. In other words, what he's saying is evidence, 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 evidence substantiates the fact that I am that Messiah, the one who would die for people's sins. So we can know those things to be true according to the scriptures. Okay, point number two, the resurrection claim can be known to be true. Now, if you flip your page, it might help you to see how these things are related. The redemption claim that we just talked about is like the top floor of your house. It's supported by the middle floor, which is the resurrection claim. The resurrection claim is that Christ uh, was raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, what does that do? It provides the evidential support for the redemption claim. So this isn't just a bullet list on PowerPoint. These claims that Paul are making are arranged in a foundational or house-like structure with a basement, a middle floor, and an upper level floor in, in that kind of structure. So the redemption claim depends on this other claim uh, about the resurrection. Why is that important? Well, it answers the question, how can we be sure that Jesus died for our sins Let's say he died for our sins. How can we be sure that he died for our sins effectively, successfully, and that God actually accepted that sacrifice? Well, the answer is because he didn't remain dead. Um, Jesus didn't remain dead because he was, in fact, a perfect sacrifice for sin, a lamb without blemish or defect, 1 Peter 1. Compare uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Remember Romans? The wages of sin is death, and anyone who sins dies. Jesus didn't die, therefore no sin. Anyone who sins dies, Jesus didn't die, or at least remained dead, therefore he was a perfect sacrifice for sin. Why is that important? It underwrites the idea that he's uh, our sacrifice, he's uh, someone who accomplished our redemption. That's part of the gospel, so we need to know that. Now, that resurrection claim itself needs support. And so that last thing on your diagram is we need a reasonable confirmation that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. So the basement and the, what's doing all the work in Paul's gospel here is that um, there's actual appearances of Jesus alive after his death. So the type of confirmation that we're talking about is twofold. So point C on your handout, the rational confirmation claim can be known to be true. So you get the way this works. Start at the top of the diagram. The redemption claim can be known to be true because it has evidence in its favor. What's the evidence? Well, it's Old Testament scripture plus the resurrection claim. That claim can be known to be true because it's got further support. The basement anchoring facts for the resurrection claim are these appearances. Okay, you weren't there. How do you know that Jesus appeared to his disciples alive after their death? You can't go back in Austin Powers' time machine and witness those events. So you get those events, you know that those events are true in a different way than the Apostle Paul or James, uh, the brother of Jesus, or the Twelve, or the women. They knew that Jesus rose in a different way than you did. Would you agree with that? They saw it, they heard it. They transmit that to us by a testimony, a perfectly legitimate way of knowing things. In fact, how, how do you know that 9-11 occurred? You weren't there, I wasn't there. The way that that gets transmitted to us by the testimony of the people who saw it, then they transfer it to us. So the pattern there is uh, very nicely uh, summarized in uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. And that's that second diagram on your handout. The Lord has a message of salvation. He uh, is attested by his miracles, which underwrites his message. The reason that you should think that the gospel is true is because the messenger 
is attested by miracles. It says God attested to it by signs and wonders and various miracles. The eyewitnesses heard the message and they saw the miracles. And then they transmitted that via testimony to us. That's the way we know so much. You, you talk to scientists. Uh, my friend Kirk Durson is teaching uh, a session and he's a PhD in science. And if you ask him, do you know all about science? He'll say, no, I know about my little sliver of the pie of science. And here's what he's going to say. Most of what I know scientifically, I know by testimony of other scientists. I can't go around and do all those experiments. I take them at their word as experts in their field and people in a position to know. If you ask a marine biologist who studies sharks about black holes, they will black out. They won't know <laughs> what you're talking about. They'll just say, see Stephen Hawking's book. Okay, so this is a perfectly legitimate way to know. And if you want a proof text for that, look at John 20, verse 29. I don't know if this is on your handout. Remember, Thomas, I got to put my hand in his side or I'm not going to believe any of this stuff. Well, is Jesus saying, I, I'm against you having evidence, you should just take it by faith? No, what he's saying is, you should have accepted the testimony of the 11 because they were in a position to know. And they're people that you can trust and, and know to be um, trustworthy in their testimony. And so when Jesus says, because you've seen, you have believed, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed, what he's saying is, um, the people who are to come, you and I, are going to believe, not because Jesus has to re Every time somebody becomes a believer, Jesus reappears and says, put your hand on my side and you won't believe. Every time? That's a little unrealistic. There's one event, uh, Christ died for sins once for all. He's not going to repeat the cross for every believer in every generation. It happens once, there's good evidence for it, and then there's testimony to those who follow. Legitimate way of knowing. Now, tests for confirmation were in the home stretch. There are at least two things we want to know if you're going to rely on testimonial evidence. One is the source of the evidence, someone in a position to know. Why don't I trust um, other religions who write about Jesus' death 650 years after his death? Because they're not in a position to know. They weren't there. And that's why I don't trust those uh, accounts. Two, you want to know, is the transmission of that testimony reliable? And here I'm going to uh, avert to a very nice book, which is now published under another title uh, by Gary Habermas called The Verdict of History, Conclusive Evidence for the Life of Jesus. It's now published under the title The Historical Jesus. It's a book that you want to read at some point in your Christian life. Um, I call it heart evidence, that's my little acronym. The gospel claims that Paul delivers to us and that by which we know that Christianity is true is based on heart evidence. Dr. Noah like that. It's a sort of a psychological claim. Heart evidence, by which I mean historical, early, and reliable testimony. Heart evidence. First, it's based on historical and early testimony. Inside, I wish we had time to go into this in more detail. Inside that little three verses that Paul quotes that he received and delivered to us, there's these terms, Cephas. That's, that's Peter's name in Aramaic. The early church, one minute after Christianity was born, what language was the early church speaking? It wasn't Greek. That's later when the gospel goes to the Gentiles. They were speaking Aramaic. So this saying that Paul received is that Cephas was one of those who witnessed Jesus' res resurrection. That indicates an early source. The 12 is an expression that's never used except in the early church. Later, how were the d disciples referred to in the New Testament? The apostles, or the gent so as the church became more Gentile in its complexion, the 12, which is probably a gesture towards the 12 tribes of, of Israel, that's, that expression is not used anymore. But in the early stages of the church, in the very, very most primitive stages of the Christian faith, they were referred to as the 12. So that suggests Paul's receiving this tradition from an earlier source. Now, critical scholars date this source. Can you believe this? So the book of 1 Corinthians is written in about 56 AD, but those three verses aren't from 56 AD. They're from three to five years after Jesus' resurrection. That's very, very close to the original events, isn't it? Jesus died in, or was crucified in approximately 30 AD. Paul's a, a conversion by his own admission in Galatians is around 33 AD. And then Paul says this, uh, in Galatians 1. Now, where would Paul have received this tradition? Well, uh, the, don't forget, the tradition mentions 
Peter as a witness, and James. He sort of comes out of left field. The, the brother of Jesus who appears in Acts chapter 15. Where did this guy come from on the list of witnesses? He's not mentioned in the Gospels as a, a witness to the resurrection. Well, Paul tells us in Galatians 1 that three years after his conversion, so that's 36 AD, that's only uh, six years after the uh, crucifixion. He says, I went to Jerusalem to Peter and James to confirm that my gospel was the same as their gospel. So it's gospel checkup. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And isn't it funny that both Cephas and James are listed in that list of appearances. Gerd Ludemann, not on your handout, an atheist critic, who's, he's an expert on the New Testament, but he's an atheist. Here's what he says in his book, The Resurrection of Jesus. The elements in Paul's tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what they're preaching in the streets of Jerusalem. So if you want to know whether the gospel that you have is the same as the gospel that Peter and James had, well, early eyewitness, they're in a position to know, you can know that. Now, is it transmitted reliably? And this will be my final point. The terms delivered and received that appear in the text are technical rabbinical terms for the transmission of teaching. So when there would be a teacher who had some ideas and some teachings uh, in the ancient world, they would designate three to five individuals in the community to memorize the teaching and put it into a memorizable, parallel structured form for the transmission to the next generation. People didn't have iPhones, iPads, they couldn't record things, they didn't even have a notebook with a pencil. So you transmitted things in an accurate oral format. And those, those terms that Paul uses are terms for the technical transmission of a, a tradition. So Paul is telling us that he's handling this information with extreme care and accuracy. The text is arranged in parallel format. Do you notice? And that, and that, and that, and that. So that you remember, there's four and that's to remember in this. Paul has obsessive compulsive disorder. Did you know that? He is totally obsessed with changing this content, the one he received and he's delivered. Galatians 1.8. This is a guy who's really, if you change it in the little, the smallest iota, He's got you in hell, basically. Uh, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached, you change it in one iota, let them be under God's curse, which in the Greek says, let them go straight to hell. So he's really upset about this. He's obsessive about the transmission of the tradition. He checks the contact. Um, Galatians 2.2, I went to Jerusalem in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles to make sure it was correct. Why? I did this privately to those who seemed to be the leaders for fear that I was running my race in vain. So he's very, very obsessive, compulsive about transmitting it totally accurately. So you have excellent reasons to believe that the gospel in 1, Peter, or 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 5 is the exact gospel that um, was preached on the streets of Jerusalem in the first century by the apostles. And I think my time has probably expired. Okay, thanks.